Today I thought I would make a video that brought together some of the pieces of chapter 20, maybe some of the stuff before, and introduced just enough of chapter 21 and 22 to get us where we're going for the rest of the semester. One of the things that I want to touch on that we saw back in chapter 19 were the ideas of uh, subgroups and generators. Because in chapter 21 and 22, we get a little bit of extra notation and um, some vocabulary to talk about things that happen in subgroups and generators. So let's suppose that I have a group G. Um, I'm going to assume that my group is finite, meaning it only has finitely many elements. So the way I would write that is absolute value bars of G is less than infinity. So in this context, those absolute value bars mean the size of the group or the cardinality, right? So we're talking about number of elements. We have another way of describing the number of elements. The definition that I want to introduce is the idea of order. The order of a group is the size or the number of elements in the group. And so we have groups of infinite order, like the integers under addition would be a group of infinite order, but the groups we're going to be interested in are groups of finite order. Like S3, for instance, the permutations of three things, there are six elements in that group. So that's a group of order six, right? So the order of S3 is six, and we write it using absolute value bars. Now, we could think about uh, the order of an element in a group. So if I have an element in a group G, let's say my group is finite, um, let's say X, so let's suppose X is an element of G, then the order of that element X is defined to be the smallest positive integer N for which x to the n is the group identity. And our notation for that is o, little o of x, the order of x. Um, now, in a finite group, every element will have finite order. That's something that you can read more about in chapter 21. But let me do an example here. So let's, um, let's look at our example S3. So that's our finite group. And let's take x to be the 3 cycle, 1, 2, 3. Um, now, I'm, I'm trying to find the order of x, so that's what I'm going for here. I Essentially, what I can do in this case is just kind of multiply x. Well, x to the 1 is 1, 2, 3, and that is not the identity, so the order isn't 1 x squared, if we do 1, 2, 3 times 1, 2, 3, we get 1, 3, 2. I'll let you check that, but that's also not the identity. But if we raise it to the third power, we get that 1 goes to 1, 2 goes to 2, and 3 goes to 3, which is sort of a silly way of writing down the identity. So the order of this element is 3. You'll notice it's a 3 cycle. Um, we could prove a proposition In Sn, um, the order of any k cycle is k. And that wouldn't be that tough to do. You just show that if you um, that when you raise it to the kth power, you do get the identity. And if you raise it to any other power that's smaller than k, you have elements that get permuted around. So this is a useful idea here. Now, in algebra, we've already seen this theme that when things are related, we give them the same notation or the same name. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. So if I take, um, you know, some examples of reused notations in our course, we've seen the colon with brackets around it a bunch of times, and this tells us something about either degree or dimension. We've seen it tells us about um, the number of cosets, number of left cosets, 
right? And we keep reusing that notation because we're going to see how these connect to one another. And so there's kind of a natural way in which these ideas all tell us something about the other ones. Another example for us, it's not notation exactly, but it's vocabulary, so let's say vocab up here, is the idea of order. And so I want to think about, um, let's think about a small group, a small finite group. Let's talk about, let's say, Z6 under addition. So there's a group. Now I want to think about the subgroup that's generated by the element 2, mod 6. And I'm looking at this as a group under addition, so to get the subgroup generated by 2, uh, well, 2 is in there. It's inverse is in there. It's inverse is 4 mod 6. When I add those together, 0 mod 6 is in there. And then I take finite sums because I'm in a group under addition, and I see that if I add these elements together, I just keep getting 0, 2, and 4 back. So this is, this is the subgroup generated by 2, and its order is 3. So it's order s of 2 mod x is 3. There are three elements in that set. Now, I want to compare that to the order of the element that I used to generate the set. So now I want to compare this, compare to order of 2 mod 6. Now, if I want to think about what this means under addition, I'm asking how many times do I add 2 to itself? Addition being the operation, so that's why I'm adding here. How many times do I add 2 mod 6 to itself? To get 0 mod 6. And I want the least possible number, so if I take 2 alone, that's not equal to 0 mod 6, so its order isn't 1. If I do 2 plus 2, I get 4, which isn't 0 mod 6. It's not 0 mod 6. But if I add it to itself 3 times, I do get 0 mod 6, and so its order is 3. So the order of 2 mod 6 is 3. And that's a nice, uh, there's a nice relationship between the order of the subgroup generated by 2 mod 6 and the order of the element. We expect those to be the same. So we could prove, like, these are the same. And we can prove that in general. And that's part of what goes on in chapter 21. Um, so the order of an element and the order of a subgroup generated by that element are closely related. All right, one of the things that we have talked about a couple times now is the idea of this homomorphism that goes from a Galois group of something to uh, one of our permutation groups, Sn, where n is the degree of the polynomial that's sort of behind the scenes. So just remember that this is a really important group homomorphism for us. It's a group homomorphism. It's one-to-one. Homomorphism. -one. It's one-to-one. -one. And there's a proposition in chapter 21, it's 21.9, that tells us what one-to-one -one group homomorphisms do to elements of order n, and it's a pretty important one. So the setup of this proposition is that we've got T, it's a one-to-one -one group homomorphism, and we've got this element G in G that has order n, sorry for this element G in G, then what we can conclude is that the order of T of G is also n. And I'll sketch this proof because it's kind of a cute one. So, proof. If I think about taking t of g and raising it to the nth power, it's a group homomorphism, and that means that this is really, it preserves multiplication, so this is going to be t of g to the nth power. 
g to the nth power is the identity because g has order n. And so that's t of the identity and one of our properties of homomorphisms is that it takes the identity to the identity. So this is the identity in G and it takes us to the identity in H. Because uh, we're one to one and G, of, G to the K is not equal to the identity in G for K less than N and I guess greater than or equal to one we have that t of g to the k, which is the same thing as t of g, all of that to the k, can't be equal to the identity of h because we, our homomorphism is one to one. So there's on, only the identity gets to go to the identity. And that's it. So that tells us that the order of t of g is n because smaller powers aren't gonna work. So the idea of order is pretty useful and it gives us this really lovely theorem due to Lagrange. So let's write it down. This is Lagrange's theorem. And Lagrange's theorem makes really formal one of the things that we noticed about cosets. If G is a finite group, so it has finite order, only finitely many elements, and S is a subgroup of G, then the size of the group G is equal to the number of left cosets of S in G times the size of the subgroup S. And this follows from one of the propositions that we had um, in, back in chapter 20. So that's kind of, that's kind of cool. Um, and a corollary to Lagrange's theorem and a few other things is that if G is a finite group of order M, so there are M elements in G, and five divides M, then G has an element of order five. So this is pretty cool. It says that if you know five divides m, you can go in to your group g and you can find some element g where you know that g to the fifth is the identity. And we're gonna use this corollary as one of the key pieces to getting our punchline for the course. So that's pretty good news for us. Um, I'm gonna quit here for today. This gives you just a few more pieces that kind of put some context around what we're doing. And the next thing we'll talk about, so coming next, are the ideas of normal subgroups. These are special subgroups where, where we take the set of left cosets by this normal subgroup and we give it a group operation, it becomes a group itself. And then we're gonna talk about these things called quotient groups which are groups formed by taking left, co left cosets of a normal subgroup, giving a group operation, and now we've got this new thing that reminds us a little bit, so in the back of your mind, think about our groups Z mod N, where we divide stuff by N and we take remainders. Those are a nice example of additive or abelian quotient groups. So that's what we'll be talking about next time. Um, as usual, put your questions on Piazza. And I will see you soon. Stay healthy and be well.